The phrase like father, like son means that children often appear and act just like their parents. This ancient proverb has been stated in English in slightly varying versions since the 1300s. When your toddler runs naked through the house, while your great aunt Myrtle is visiting, it's easy to point fingers and maniacally tell your other half, he gets that from you. And as it turns out, you might have a good reason to cast blame. According to science, children tend to be more like their fathers genetically speaking. According to a study conducted at the University of North Carolina, mammals including humans tend to be more like their fathers than their mothers. While it still remains true that genetic material is inherited equally from both parents, the researchers found that mammals tend to use more of the DNA that come from the father more than the mother. They also found that a gene mutation may cause very different results depending on which parent it was inherited from. For example, if a child inherited a disease from the mother, it would not be as prominent as it would be if the same disease was inherited by the father. Many men are love-starved for their fathers and deny it. To let this out of the bag is to face a great deal of anger, rejection, and sadness. What is possible between a father and son? What can men do with the array of untapped emotions that shield them from knowing themselves? As adult men we can't pretend away old and resolved wounds, because the hurts eventually resurface in other areas of our lives. The unexpressed hurt and anger often transfer onto our love relationships, parenting, challenges at work, and problems with authority. In the case of William Gerald Zern Jr., born December 5, 1958, in Cincinnati, Ohio. The relationship he had with his father was extravagant. William Gerald Zern Jr. came to prison because he wanted to revenge on a man who had been a police informant who helped the police to bring his father to jail. On May 12, 1984, Zern shot and killed 24-year-old Gregory Earls with a single shot to the chest from a pistol. The murder was a revenge killing. In 1979, Earls, who was a police informant, had helped convict Zern's father of drug trafficking. Zern's father served five years probation for the offense, although he later claimed he was framed. A day after the killing, Zern was arrested at an apartment and offered no resistance. He was then placed in the community correctional institution in Hamilton County. While awaiting trial for the murder of Gregory Earls, on May 14, 1984, William G. Zern was incarcerated at the Community Correctional Institute in Hamilton County, Ohio. He was the sole occupant of a cell located in a section of the institution designed for those individuals charged with serious crimes. Sometime in the latter part of May 1984, Zern had a conversation with another inmate, Wayne C. Lewis, in which he expressed a general animosity towards correctional officers for failing to give him his full five minutes of telephone time. Lewis also had observed Zern sharpening a straightened portion of a metal bucket hook over the course of three days. Thereafter, Lewis informed a corrections officer that Zern had a knife or a shank. Chi supervisors ordered a search of several cells to recover the weapon. On the evening of June 9, 1984, several officers were ordered to search Zern's cell, among others. At approximately 10.20 p.m., officers Jaw Burton and Philip Pence arrived to perform the search and found Zern lying naked in his bunk. Officer Pence ordered Zern to get to his feet. William Gerald Zern then stood at the door of the cell. Pence unlocked the cell and told Zern to come out and put his hands against the wall. Zern suddenly lunged at Pence and stabbed him with the metal shank. The instrument entered Pence's body at the lower left side of the chest. After the door was secured and Zern confined, Pence lifted his shirt to observe the injury, at which time he began to feel faint. 
After a nurse was summoned, Pence was rushed to a nearby hospital. Despite efforts to save his life, Pence died. An autopsy determined that death occurred as a result of the stab injury to the chest which penetrated Pence's heart. Authorities immediately recovered the weapon used by Zern. It was a long dagger-like piece of metal, approximately seven inches long. One end was sharpened to a point, and the other was curved into a loop. Zern was indicted for purposely causing the death of another with prior calculation and design in violation of the law. The offense was committed while Zern was a prisoner in a detention facility as specified in that the offense was committed while the victim was a peace officer, whom Zern knew to be such, and at the time of the commission of the offense. The victim was engaged in his duties as a police officer and that the offense alleged in this indictment was committed while the victim was a police officer, whom Zer knew to be such. And at the time of the commission of the offense alleged herein, it was Zern's specific purpose to kill a police officer. In September 1984, Zern was tried for the murder of Philip Pence. William G. Zern Jr. entered a plea of not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. Throughout his trial, Zern refused to take the stand and testify on his own behalf. His defense attorneys called no witnesses and made no opening statements. Two inmates who had been imprisoned with William G. Zern Jr. testified against him. On October 1, 1984, Zern was found guilty of aggravated murder in the death of Pence. On October 3rd, the jury recommended Zern receive the death penalty. On October 5th, Judge William Morrissey sentenced Zern to death. In November 1984, Zern pleaded guilty to aggravated murder in the shooting of Gregory Earls. On November 19, 1984, William G. Zern Jr. was sentenced to a life term, which was to run concurrently with his death sentence in Pence's murder. On October 14, 1985, Zern and several other inmates, including death row inmates J.D. Scott and John William Byrd Jr., took two guards hostage at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility. The prisoners demanded that they receive free deodorant access to televisions and radios, more desserts, and transfers to the Franklin County Jail. They threatened to harm the guards if the demands were not met. After 15 hours of negotiations, the guards were released and harmed. The Ohio Supreme Court has set a June 8th execution date for William G. Zern, 45 who killed jailer Philip Pence with a homemade knife on June 9, 1984. A federal judge has put the execution on hold. While an appeals court considers whether to let the state proceed, the Ohio Parole Board holds a hearing in Columbus to determine whether to recommend that Governor Bob Taft grant clemency. On June 8, 2004, Zern was executed via lethal injection at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility, one day prior to the 20th anniversary of Pence's murder. He offered no last words and refused to see his two sisters. His last meal consisted of mashed potatoes with gravy, lasagna, macaroni and cheese, garlic bread, cherry cheesecake, chocolate milk, hot sauce, and salt. William G. Zern, Jr. was placed on his back on a padded table to be prepped for his death. Technicians placed shunts into both of his outstretched arms as William G. Zern, Jr. alternately closed his eyes and narrowly opened them. His face remained stoic throughout the process, which took several minutes and caused him to bleed visibly out of his right arm. William G. Zern, Jr. was dressed in a prison-issued white shirt, blue pants with red stripes running down each side, and white socks. He wore his own brown hiking boots. His head was shaven, and he wore a thick beard without a mustache. Zern complied with every command, 
lifting his hands to be placed in handcuffs before he was led into the death chamber. The chamber was dimly lit with a tiled floor and cinder block walls painted white. Warden Haviland picked up a microphone and asked, Mr. Zern, do you have any last statement you would like to make? No, was Zern's terse reply as he continued to stare at the ceiling. He never turned to see witnesses in either of two small rooms that were separated by from the death chamber by windows. Haviland gave a secret command at 9.58 a.m. to begin injecting the drugs, and two officials turned on Ives to begin pouring drugs into his veins. Only one of the two cocktails contained the lethal drugs, and neither operator knew which one was real and which was harmless, according to Dean. Within two minutes, Zern's breathing became faint, and within three, breathing was no longer visible. By 10.01, his head began turning purple. The 45-year-old died six minutes after two lethal drugs, pancuronium bromide to stop his breathing and potassium chloride to stop his heartbeat, began flowing into his veins. His death was a peaceful one. His chest heaved several times, and his lips parted with slightly labored breathing for several minutes before his breathing stopped forever. Zern's face and shaved head turned lightly purple before prison officials drew a curtain between Zern and the witnesses at 10. 3 a.m. after a prison doctor performed a quick examination, the curtain was reopened and Warden James Haviland drew a microphone to his mouth and said, Time of death 10.04 a.m. After Zern was pronounced dead, witnesses were led back through a courtyard where a black Cadillac hearse awaited. Zern was transported to a local funeral home and was buried in a state-run cemetery adjacent to a prison in Chillicothe, because his family did not have the means to arrange a private burial. Thank you for watching Death Row.